Tina tātai katoa, uh, tina te mihi uh, koutou mō tēnei rā, uh, ngā mihi nui uh, mō tēnei kaupapa, uh, ka tīmata tātou mō te karakia. Uh, he honore, he kororia ki te atua, he maunga rongo ki te whenua, e whakaro pai ki ngā tāngata katoa, a ke a ke, amene. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou, welcome to our um, CARES uh, Activist in Residence uh, series. And um, it's been a pleasure to have you with us, uh, Tina, uh, throughout uh, uh, this whole week. We began with a public presentation. We had a workshop. Um, today, we are launching the white paper, which we are going to call um, uh, not white paper, because <laughs> Tina asked this question, why do we call it white paper? That's an interesting question to uh, reflect upon. Um, and and uh, what we're going to do is after we uh, present some of the key thoughts in the paper, uh, we will open up the space for uh, conversation. Uh, just for those of you that are watching online, we also have uh, an interview that is set up and that will be uh, released uh, tomorrow on the online uh, site. So it's a pleasure having with you us, uh, uh, Tina and really looking forward to this kōrero. So this paper is uh, titled Māori Migrant Solidarities in Resisting White Supremacy. And we will go back and forth in dialogue. What I will do is begin by defining some of the key terms and ideas. And then uh, Tina will discuss the history of white supremacy in Aotearoa. So white supremacy, the belief that white people constitute a superior race and therefore legitimately should dominate society, shapes the infrastructure of the settler colonial state in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Underlying white supremacy are the overarching values of whiteness, the ideology that the values of white culture are universal markers of progress. The whiteness of the crown, built on the hegemonic values of white culture, is built to perpetuate violence directed at Maori. Inherent to whiteness is the systemic devaluing of communities targeted with colonial violence, marking these communities as primitive and simultaneously erasing the cognitive capacities of colonized peoples, this, uh, the process of um, cognitive epistemicide. The racist violence of white supremacy targeting Tangata Fenua in Aotearoa, we argue, forms the basis of the hate directed toward diverse communities here. In this paper, we suggest that the violence mobilized by white supremacy directed historically at Maori in Aotearoa, New Zealand, exists in continuity with the violence of the white supremacist colonial project directed at indigenous peoples globally and people's spaces of the global south over the past six centuries. So white supremacy in that sense is not new, but it is um, embedded historically within uh, structures, institutions, and uh, crown processes. For a large number of ethnically diverse migrants in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the driving force of white supremacy forms the bedrock of connection with Tangata Fenua, shaped by the interconnected spaces of colonial violence. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking a little bit now to the history of white supremacy in Aotearoa uh, in the years leading up to the dispatch of James Cook to Te Moananuia Kiwa in pursuit of the great southern continent. Cook had been stationed during the Seven Year War on Mohawk waters in the lands today known as Kanata within the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the St. Lawrence River. This is where he learned his map making skills. And at that time, during the Seven Year War, 
which was itself a product of European imperial expansion into Great Turtle Island by both French and English military forces who were vying for colonial entitlements falsely granted under the doctrine of discovery. Cook was mentored by Field Marshal Geoffrey Amherst, who advocated for biological warfare against Indigenous groups. Also present at the time uh, during the Seven Year War was uh, Sir Joseph Banks, who was uh, sponsoring research into the transmissibility of viruses through uh, pieces of, of cloth as they were handed out. Field Marshal Geoffrey Amherst famously distributed smallpox infected blankets amongst Mohawk communities prior to invading them in order to thin them out and was a fan of the conquistador method of training dogs upon the taste of indigenous flesh, again as a violent method of thinning groups out prior to invasion by colonial forces. And it's important to note these aspects because it sets the context of the European colonial mindset as it turned its gaze towards Aotearoa and Te Mananuia Kiwa in continuation of the global colonial imperial project. Cook's numerous proclamations of discovery here in Aotearoa, in addition to the lives that were taken and the conscious spread of infection across sites in Te Mananui Akiwa and Te Waipounamu, exhibits an extinguishment of native title and clear disregard for the humanity and human rights of Indigenous peoples, which is a clear legacy of the white supremacist mindset that is entrenched within the doctrine of discovery. So at this point, we have three centuries of European imperialism across the world playing out. And they had uh, taken these entitlements, which were accorded through the doctrine of discovery, and entrenched them into the European social psyche through Enlightenment period theories. The entitlement of historical figures such as Edward Gibbon Wakefield to establish markets for stolen Maori land and the settler scramble that ensued from that market further demonstrates the way in which entitlement to Indigenous lands had become normalised within the European mindset at that time. As concluded by the Waitangi Tribunal in the Paparahi Oteraki claim, the small pockets of humanitarian intent were completely eclipsed by an overarching imperial imperative, even during the signing of Te Tiriti or Waitangi. And when the British Parliament passed the 1852 New Zealand Constitution Act, establishing a settler colonial government upon false grounds of session for Te Ika Maui and upon equally false grounds of discovery for Te Waipounamu, it did so within a white supremacist social context that would continue to generate ongoing violations of Te Tiriti or Waitangi with impunity from that point until now. It was within the same colonially racist context that subsequent in immigration policy was also grown by the New Zealand Crown, including the Chinese Immigrants Act of 1881 and the Immigration Restriction Act of 1899, and within which the New Zealand settler social psyche operated in its treatment of non-white peoples, exampled by the murder of Jo Kum Yung in September 1905 and subsequent hate crimes against migrants and Māori across the same period until now. So we argue that migration is intertwined with the project of white supremacy that underlies the crown. Migration and movements from post-colonial contexts of the global south need to be read in the context of the colonial project. The violence of slavery as forced movement of people is intertwined with the violence of colonial land grab. The colonial violence of white supremacy has historically expelled and displaced people from their land, livelihoods, and spaces of everyday living. So we need to look at migration in relationship to these forced expulsions and displacements. Simultaneously, colonial processes created borders to maintain the political and economic interests of colonizers, marking bodies as illegitimate through the organizing of citizenship and democracy. Democracy in this sense is inherently a racist and colonial project. Note here the ways in which English as a language, and this is just one apparatus of democracy, 
Note here the ways in which English as a language is placed at the core of the Anglosphere empire, shaping its information sharing, immigration, and military infrastructures. English is simultaneously deployed to set up and naturalize racist decision-making processes to manage borders, upholding the whiteness of settler colonial spaces. The overarching ideology of whiteness that shapes crown immigration structures works in the concept of deservedness, the deserving migrant, and drives the institutionalized and structural racism that constitute migrant refugee experiences. And in that sense, one would argue that crown immigration infrastructures are at their core racist. Now, the Bretton Woods institutions as the new face of colonialism constructed economic and political infrastructures that maintain the colonial project, reproducing and perpetuating extractive purposes and practices constructed as the new world order or neo-colonialism as we see it. The existing forms of extractive colonialism were renewed in the form of debt programs carried out by international financial institutions, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, paving the way for structural adjustment programs or SAPs that were imposed top down on indebted nations as a basis for opening up new markets for transnational capital. Here it's worth noting that transnational capital located at the seats of empire in the primarily in the US. Salient here are the roles of the US and UK as empire pushing imperial policies in the form of global free market through the performance of democracy promotion. Once again, inherently a violent project underguarded by uh, racist ideas. These neo-colonial processes defined intellectual property under the overarching ideology of whiteness, extracting indigenous and local knowledge and organizing the theft of knowledge and cultural practices that we continue to see in the forms of practices of biopiracy, often directed and at indigenous and local communities in the global south. Violence lies at the core of the neoliberal project, we argue. Consider here the whiteness of neocolonial violence that shaped US-led genocides in Indonesia, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Chile, just some examples creating the political economy conditions for the imposition of free market economics in the service of global capital, turning to authoritarian violence and repression, ironically framed as democracy promotion. So the white man's democracy in that sense is essentially a performance in hypocrisy. The whiteness of neocolonial violence that feeds the ongoing accelerated adoption of neoliberal policies continually displaces people from land, through its extractive practices, expelling them into global value chains as cheap, expendable, hyper-precarious labor to be exploited and silenced through strategies of repression. The nature of white colonial violence consolidates power, working aggressively to centralize resources and decision-making processes at the core, while simultaneously dispossessing communities and spaces it constructs as semi-peripheries and peripheries, the crux of world systems theory as an explanatory phenomena for looking at global capital. The framework of multiculturalism created by the Crown is based on the underlying logic of whiteness, constructing diverse ethnic communities as cultural essence. Crown multiculturalism is driven by the Orientalist fixing of cultures as essence, and culture synonymized with community is deployed to organize diversity, inclusion, and equity within the settler colonial architectures, which we see time and time again as they reframe the parameters through which we are able to express ourselves. And it's a reductionist approach that generally allows cultural expression but denies political expression in those spaces and certainly inhibits political alliances in those spaces as well. Once we are fixed into this cultural essence, culture is turned into a category to be managed in service to the crown who continue to apply whiteness as the default backdrop upon which multicultural expressions are allowed to be played out. And in that sense, it tends to erase the nuanced relationships in that space, the nuanced relationship, especially in particular, of the treaty partnership 
in a way in which it, it others and otherizes everything and everybody who is not white. The hegemonic constructions of multiculturalism are intertwined with crown violations of te tiriti or waitangi, reflecting the underlying values of whiteness. This cultural reductionism denies political agency to non-white groups, denies ethnic communities political identity, and undermines the political authority of Māori as treaty partners. The acceptance of this constructed dualism can lead to lateral tensions between Māori and migrant groups who are positioned as mutual others in opposition to the Crown as the authority. And as we can see in this diagram here, uh, negates and erases the central aspect of the, of the treaty relationship. The violence of white supremacy that underpins settler colonialism is deeply intertwined with the production and circulation of fear. The construction of non-white people as savage and untrustworthy mobilizes and falsely legitimizes the violence of colonial occupation and oversight. White fears constructed around the narrative of the dangerous black or brown masses threatening to take over presumed white spaces and is predicated upon the erasure of actual and threatened white violence vis-a-vis institutionalized impunity of white supremacist harassment and demonstrations of colonial military might or hyper-surveillance and over-policing of marginalized and indigenous communities. The narrative of white fear forms the basis of the great replacement theory, a core ideology of the global white supremacist movement. Salient here is the organizing of white fear across different structures of white supremacy that flow from the crown security intelligence and military structures to the far right white supremacist movements that mobilize violence. And interestingly, as Professor Mohan Dutta mentioned earlier, you know, there's an aspect of this that relates to the English language. The military, uh, sorry, the, the colonial alliances, which dominate the space at the, at the moment, uh, those being the alliances between English-speaking nations, which of course have a history rooted in uh, Commonwealth and the spread of the British Empire, but is also unified through being the dominant English-speaking nations of the USA, Canada, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. The dominant alliances and work streams that operate through that alliance operate across military information sharing and immigration um, agreements. Those are the dominant work streams in that space. And there's uh, no mistake there. It's because of the, the, um, the ways in which these forces operate to maintain colonial oppression across these spaces. Uh, and we can also see that there is a connection here across uh, the colonial violence continuum that includes a wide range of exercises of white supremacy within social institutions, the vast bulk of which there is no action taken over. All of these actions of white supremacy are permitted within a, a crown superstructure of colonialism, and only some parts of the white identity extreme violence are uh, take, taken action upon. These structures are themselves constructed upon alliances rooted in colonial histories, and they operate at a transnational level to maintain colonial domination. And fear is discursively circulated to carry out violence as evident in the white supremacist terror attacks across the globe. Fragility to the exposure of whiteness functions within this space to maintain systemic blind spots surrounding the complicitness of the Crown government in structures of white supremacy and further protect the colonial fiduciary relationship where non-white rights are regulated and uh, administered by the Crown. White fragility is carefully woven into institutional and crown structures in Aotearoa to silence conversations on whiteness and racism on the settler colonial state. 
Consider here the recent targeted attacks directed at Minister of Violence Prevention, the Honourable Marama Davidson, organised around her comment when accosted by a far-right platform at an anti-transgender event, referring to white cis men as the drivers of violence. The backlash organised and circulated virally by the far-right, given credence through mainstream political parties and media, demonstrates the nature of white fragility at work to silence critical conversations that highlight the role of whiteness within colonial systems of harm. And you could see even in that context that uh, the way that media treated that was to go straight to the numbers and start to analyse the statement of white cis men as the drivers of harm in this world. And there was no credence given to the systemic nature of who creates that context, who creates the policies, who benefits those policies, who experiences impunity from the violence that is visited through that system as well. All of that was absent in the media and they instead, instead turned to um, give credence to the outcry and the offence of white men by turning to a reductionist approach and looking at those numbers. So divide and rule is a powerful tool in the perpetuation of the colonial project. The white supremacy of the colonial project targets Māori and migrant communities simultaneously to produce fear. Migrants have fed the colonial lie that to uphold the principles of Titiriti somehow may deplete migrant rights, fundamentally communicatively inverting the role of Titiriti as the basis for migrant belonging here in Aotearoa. Similarly, Māori communities who are marginalised by settler colonial practices of dispossession are targeted by far-right anti-migrant forces, constructing migrants as the threat to economic opportunities for Māori. Consider here the ways in which the racist trope around Māori as dangerous is organised in the context of the thefts at dairy shops that are largely owned by Indian migrants, and the equally racist trope that migrant groups are responsible for diminished access to employment and social housing, triggering Māori trauma of colonial invasion and reorienting it towards nationalist xenophobic agendas. Within an anti-colonial critical framework, the convergences of experience between Māori and migrant groups far outweigh <clears throat> the differences. And that is a reflection which was affirmed by Kite Faiao Kitao Marama, uh, the Community Engagement Report for Developing a National Action Plan Against Racism. And in that report, they found that ethnic Tangata Tiriti participants recognised that the racism that they experienced and the barriers that they encounter are inextricable and, and, excuse me, and inextricably linked to the colonisation of Aotearoa and the suppression of the tinoranga tiratanga of tangata whenua. So now we turn to digital infrastructures of white supremacy. And as we get here, you'll see the way in which we are establishing this argument <clears throat> is to see the contemporary expressions of white supremacy as flowing from the colonial history of white supremacy that is embedded within the structures and institutions of settler colonial states. The global proliferation of white supremacy is mobilized through digital platforms in this contemporary uh, turn to white supremacy. The organizing logics of contemporary digital technology reflecting the colonial drivers of the industrial revolution embody white supremacy. In that sense, these technologies are embodiments of the underlying ideology of white supremacy. Note here, for instance, the commoditization of participation as data, the ongoing colonial theft of data, and the organizing of data to generate accelerated profits from the circulation of hate. After all, the profit-making logics of these platforms are driven by the viral nature of uh, hate. That hate goes viral on digital platforms is deeply intertwined with the organizing logics of digital platforms, reflecting the white supremacist ideology that underlies the platforms, generating profits from exponentially growing viewership, responses, and sharing of racist violence and hate. So all these mechanisms that perpetuate hate are inherent to the logics of the platforms. 
the threats to democratic processes posed by white supremacy that are mobilized on digital platforms, we argue, exist in continuity with the racist erasures that make up the whiteness of the democracy project under colonialism. So democracy itself in its Eurocentric vision is reflective of this white supremacist structure. The systemic exclusion of indigenous, black, and brown colonized peoples from the democratic processes of the colonial state formed the very infrastructure of the <coughs> Eurocentric project of global democracy. Consider, for instance, in the US, the harbinger of global democracy, the ways in which voter suppression is organized around racial logics constructed to erase black Americans actively from voting processes. Note here the organizing of disinformation in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that simultaneously targets Maori migrant, particularly Muslim migrants, Pacifica and transgender communities, framing these communities as threats to democracy. Consider, for instance, the rhetoric of um, one person, one vote that deeply uh, demonstrates this uh, racist ideology. It is critical to observe here the intersections between anti-Maori hate on digital platforms, COVID-19 related disinformation, misogyny, Islamophobia, and related anti-migrant attitudes and anti-transgender hate. We find these to be intersecting, as has been pointed out by a number of empirical reports. Particular intersections of white supremacist hate are critical here in terms of their exponentially potent nature, such as the hate targeting Maori women, particularly Maori women who speak out against this infrastructure of hate. We will now turn to strategies for resisting white supremacy. We argue because white supremacy is by its very nature global, the strategies of resistance to white supremacy must be sutured through the exploration and building of locally situated, contextually embedded connections. So forging really alternative rationalities of connection uh, rooted in our decolonizing and anti-colonial principles. Amidst the large scale violence propelled by the cognitive epistemicide carried out by the settler colonial project, the voices of indigenous, migrant, and local communities across the global South keep alive the possibilities of hope. Nurturing these relationships at local, domestic, regional, and transnational level provides the basis for responding to the multi-leveled threat of white supremacy. This includes internal education work within our relative communities to grow mutual understanding and solidarity developing independent mechanisms for information sharing between marginalized communities, which highlight key actors, tactics, financial networks, and critical relationships within global white supremacist movements. So really seeing, for instance, the ways in which the COVID-19 disinformation networks are connected to white supremacist networks and Trumpian ecosystems and extends to physical acts of solidarity between marginalized communities during political actions. At the foundation of the organizing of legal, political, economic, and social structures in Aotearoa, New Zealand is Te Tiriti or Waitangi. Te Tiriti, we argue, offers the core infrastructure for resistance to white supremacy in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The Declaration of Independence of the United Tribes of New Zealand, together with Te Tiriti or Waitangi, collectively constitute the first immigration documents of Aotearoa. Te Tiriti or Waitangi, in particular, is the source of non Maori rights within Aotearoa and sets the standards by which non Maori may call Aotearoa home. Te Tiriti o Waitangi was clearly envisioned by signatory Rangatira as a tool with the potential to limit the harmful reach of colonial entitlement on these shores. As such, the forging of relationships and connections on the basis of Te Tiriti o Waitangi offers an organizing register for building a pathway for resistance to the project of global white supremacy. In considering what it is to be treaty centered, we can look again to the findings of the Paparahit Kitiraki State One report, which clearly outlined the expectations of Rangatira signatories to Titiriti. They found that the Rangatira understood Kawanatanga primarily as the power to control settlers and thereby keep the peace and protect Maori interests accordingly. 
that rangatira would retain their independence and authority as rangatira and would be the governor's equal, and that land transactions would be regulated in some way, that the Crown would enforce Māori understanding of pre-treaty land transactions and therefore return land that settlers had not properly acquired, and that it may also have involved protection of New Zealand from foreign powers. Essentially, that's talking about land back and it has the potential to also talk about the responsibility of the Crown to act in a more protective measure towards Māori communities and the threats that they face from global transnational white supremacist movements. We think that few, if any rangatira, would have envisaged the governor having authority to intervene in internal Māori affairs, although many would have realised that where the populations intermingled, questions of relative authority would need to be negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis, as was typical for rangatira to rangatira relationships. The standards of Tiriti, of Te Tiriti or Waitangi, centered solidarity that we can draw from this understanding of uh, the signing of Te Tiriti or Waitangi <coughs> include the basic standards of land back. Solidarity and the call for independent authority of Rangatira Māori over Te Ao Māori. The protection of Māori from foreign threats and shared power over matters that impact upon Māori and Tauiwi. Contemporary reflections upon the role of Te Tiriti or Waitangi in relation to immigration policy can also be found within the Matike Mai Aotearoa report on constitutional transformation, which you can go on to Google right now and download yourself for free to read through, and I would recommend you do that. Reflections within that process uh, relate to the following, that when we say we don't just mean us or the Pākehā who have been here for generations, it's everyone. And that's what Te Tiriti allows for. We now have this multicultural place, but it all began in the treaty and the relationship that's meant to exist between us and the Crown. It's just tikanga to recognise the relationship with Tangata Tiriti, even if they haven't always recognised us. That's a really important value, but it needs the same manaki that our people tried to show to the very first Pākehā. The discussions about how Te Tiriti valued and embraced everyone in the community were also about the need to ensure that all peoples could fully participate in political affairs. That is the need to guarantee fair representation for everyone in both of the different spheres of influence and in the relational sphere between them. The invitational promise of Te Tiriti o Waitangi is reflected in the tikanga of aroha and manaakitanga that foster dialogue and secure equitable political participation. Resistance to white supremacy organised around the principles of kaupapa Māori turns to radical love as the basis for relating to each other. Rather than consolidating, consolidating spaces of resistance around culturally essentialist ideas that are grounded in narrow concepts of how does this movement benefit me or the people that I represent, the concept of radical love suggests the continual centering of spaces of hitherto erased voices. Rather than performing shallow victimhood based on marginality, Radical love offers an ongoing invitation to the other. Amidst the global rise of organizing values of individualism, self-serving accumulation and self-interest, which is sitting at the heart of racism and white supremacy, the values of aroha and manaakitanga draw from kaupapa Māori in a way that turns movements towards the other with openness and based on deep awareness of the processes of exclusion and working through dialogues to invite in the other, mirroring our traditional processes of pōhiri, whakatau, fitifiti kōrero and wānanga. 
It is fit and drawing from tikanga Māori as a framework within the context of anti-colonialism. It is imperative that we resist cultural reductionism and extraction by understanding, respecting, and supporting political kaupapa as defined by Te Ao Māori. This extends to support for land back movements, triti centred constitutional transformation, and indigenous led climate justice movements. Connected to this, then, are the habits of critical reflexivity. We see the importance of cultivating deep critical reflexivity in communities that are target of white supremacy. So not the kind of superficial performativity that is self-serving, but continually interrogating who is not present in this space and how to invite those voices in. The pedagogy of critical reflexivity explores deeply the interplays of power and control that shape the processes of dispossession and marginalization. For ethnic migrant communities, the practices of deep critical reflexivity interrogate the shallow performances of traditionalism and cultural essentialism that draw upon superficial similarities with essentialist depictions of Maori cultural values. We note here the cultural cachet that is often drawn from such culturally essentialist performances and therefore work well in the marketplace um, within the neoliberal logics. Uh, for instance, we note the shallow co-option of Maori cultural practices to perform similarity and connection by far-right or right-wing Hindutva groups here in Aotearoa by appealing to tradition, by hosting events such as conferences of the elders and traditions, simultaneously fixing tradition within a politics of exclusion, marginalization, and in the worst instances, uh, supporting far-right fascist politics. Such superficial appeals to tradition on one hand are deployed to perpetuate exclusionary practices, and on the other hand, perpetuate the settler colonial violence on Maori through the circulation of static, static culturalist tropes, mirroring the orientalist strategies of the crown. So this process of fixing as tradition actually reproduces the fundamental orientalist nature of white supremacy. In the context of Hindutva, for instance, the practices of critical reflexivity would attend to the ongoing marginalization of Adivasi communities, you know, indigenous people living in forests by Hindutva structures in India. Simultaneously, the habits of critical reflexivity would push ethnic migrant communities toward exploring what possibilities for deep solidarity look like, calling upon the body and situating it along land occupations and resistance against the ongoing dispossession of Maori from land. So it really calls for an embodied politics of finding and building connections. Such an important point that's made there because, you know, we're looking at um, now one of the more recent kind of developments of the resistance movements characterised by the fact that uh, Crown and colonial and neo-colonial institutions have become incredibly sophisticated at learning how to make a grand gesture and ride the media of that grand gesture that doesn't actually amount to anything at all, either because it's a very performative gesture at the beginning, or they make a grand gesture and then spend the years following that grand gesture under-resourcing and systemically undercutting the force of whatever that gesture was, destining, creating a destiny for that grand gesture to uh, fail or to simply... Um, edge out of existence in the first place. And critical to that practice also is our own permissiveness in that space of using cultural essentialism to as the uh, rationalizing, legitimizing feature for these grand gestures that ultimately amount to not much at all. Across Indigenous communities and settler colonies and local communities in the global, uh, in the global South that have historically been marked as targets of settler colonialism, economies of care offer registers for transformative resistance. Capitalism as the underlying economics of white supremacy perpetuates extractive and exploitative practices that work simultaneously to destroy nature, human relationships and human life and externalizing the costs of that harm to the public sphere. Industries have grown around the grief and trauma of the colonial project, including refuge and aid economies, which reaffirm 
racist hierarchies. In spite of the extensive violence unleashed by the colonial capitalist project, indigenous and local communities in the global south hold within them forms of knowledge and foreground practices of care that are politically potent actions which push back against the seemingly intractable forces of, of capitalism. <clears throat> In Aotearoa, for instance, the organising of Māori communities around Aroha and Manaakitanga sustained and nurtured everyday life amidst crises such as the pandemic and the floods of 2023. In Telangana, South India, the organising of Dalit or oppressed caste landless women farmers into Sangams cooperatives sustained practices of community-based seed banks and seed sharing organised around principles of care. Further, for many of these subsistence communities, economic and ecological imperatives are complementary, not contradictory. The tikanga of Kaitekitanga and Manakitanga relate similarly across human and ecological contexts in an understanding of the interdependency of nature and humankind. Under this paradigm, communities have not only withstood the aftermath of natural disasters and provided for each other, but have also protected the vast majority of the planet's remaining biodiversity and sequestered significant levels of carbon, facts which bear considerable relevance as the world is increasingly forced to reconsider what kind of global economy will provide an, a habitable planet for future generations. The locally situated, culturally grounded, contextually embedded, decentralised economies of care or monarchy descent to the centralizing processes of political and economic organizing shaped by white supremacy. In understanding that, we have to see that imperialism is at its heart an inherently centralizing process that creates citadels and sites of extraction in service to those citadels. It creates rural isolation. It creates fringeness. And those sites are generally turned into sites of manual labor and resource extraction in service of the capitalist uh, hubs, business and social hubs. Now, how do we sustain these economies of care, these spaces of alternative organizing against the hegemonic forces of uh, capital? Uh, here we talk about the ways in which the idea of communicative sovereignty and building voice infrastructures offer entry points for communities to organize, relate with each other, and connect with each other. Amidst the systemic erasure of communicative spaces for the participation of colonized peoples in the process of knowledge generation, that process of cognitive epistemicide, communicative sovereignty, the ownership of communicative resources and infrastructures in the hands of indigenous and local communities serves as the basis for structural transformation, the capacity of communities to tell their stories, the capacities of communities to own their knowledge and articulate this knowledge as the basis for challenging the driving forces of whiteness. Culture-centered processes of social change attend to the communicative processes that shape the co-creation of voice infrastructures for the participation of communities at the global margins in organizing for social justice. Building voice infrastructures for participation of Maori and migrant communities in dialogue, we believe, lies at the heart of resisting white supremacy in its political, economic, societal, cultural, and institutional forms. Here we note the ways in which the crown systematically um, erases these opportunities and openings for dialogue such that the crown becomes the key mediator of uh, migrant Maori uh, relationships. Um, and in that process can perpetuate its divide and rule policies. Uh, the voice infrastructures co-created through the active participation of Maori and ethnically diverse migrant communities in dialogue bypass and unsettle the overarching logics of whiteness. So delinking from whiteness to create alternative links and spaces, fostering openings for deep listening to each other, exploring convergences, and at the same time, recognizing our differences and departures in our mutual stories, and then learning to work through these departures to be beside each other, placing our bodies alongside each other. 
Whiteness works through the production and perpetuation of the myth of separation. The whiteness of the crown reduces international relations and trade policies into opportunist calculations based on appeals to national interest. Such narrow considerations of national interest embedded within the colonial capitalist forces that uphold contemporary neoliberalism undermine indigenous, non-white, labor, migrant and environmental rights alike. International relations based upon national interests are constituted within the wider white supremacist global superstructure, organizing questions of security, intelligence, data gathering, and military strategy within racist infrastructures. Note here the participation of Aotearoa in the large scale militarization of the Pacific, increasing proportionally to political tensions between Pacific Rim states and reflected by the increase of military sites and assets across the Pacific and Aotearoa. Military participation in RIMPAC and ongoing moves towards New Zealand membership in the AUKUS Military Alliance. Such activities and relationships significantly increase risk to Indigenous and local communities across the Pacific, whilst also increasing New Zealand's complicitness in the neo-colonial alliance structure of military might, which continues to drive the unjust movement of peoples around the globe. Similarly, critical here is the lack of critical reflexivity when engaging far-right or fascist regimes such as Hindutva in India, Israeli occupation of Palestine, and or Indonesian occupation of Papua, of West Papua. Critical to enhanced relationships of solidarity is the need to deeply wānanga our relative histories of colonial oppression in order to understand and respect where migrant and Māori pathways converge and diverge. This was exampled by the strong response of Māori and Pacifica communities in Aotearoa to the Black Lives Matter movement, whilst also demonstrating a propensity for co-option of Black popular culture and the continued perpetuation of anti-Black racism within Māori and Pacifica communities. Understanding our distinct experiences at the hands of white supremacy is critical to moving past superficial expressions of solidarity that can dangerously stray into lateral entitlement. An anti-racist framework built upon deep understanding and based upon transnational solidarities further calls for active construction of anti-racist strategies at a global scale weaving together connections with people and communities experiencing the marginalizing effects of racism that draw upon the principles of aroha, mana motuhake, and manaakitanga. We recognize here the actually existing histories of transnational solidarities amongst anti-colonial Black, Indigenous, and migrant rights. And we see these types of uh, contexts playing out when transnational forums such as the United Nations claim the right to be able to regulate, administer, and, uh, and care for areas be between imposed colonial national jurisdiction known as the high seas and apply their own policies into that space. And that assumption is premised upon the idea that Indigenous peoples of Wananui Akiwa have not always had our own alliances and cared for those shared spaces between us for thousands and thousands of years very successfully. And of course, that has fallen apart under the framework of, um, of guidance of the Convention of the Law of the Seas under the United Nations, who has overseen a period of extreme overfishing, overextraction, seabed mining, and military uh, war games played out across those same areas to disastrous consequences. We also interrogate here the organizing logics of white structures, such as the United Nations, in mediating those infrastructures that work actively to erase the knowledge, stories, practices, and relationships of transnational solidarities against racism and harm, capitalism, and climate colonialism. The potential of Indigenous migrant solidarity is huge, with Indigenous populations and migrant populations collectively accounting for 781 million people worldwide. Kia ora, Tina. It's been such a pleasure to participate with you in this uh, dialogue. And uh, 
you know, part of this process has been sort of testing how far we could go with saying what we wanted to say. And I just feel so humbled that we have been able to, I feel from my part, say the kinds of things that needed to be said. Mm. Yeah. It's been so, a great honor to work alongside you as well. And it fills me with hope for the potential of the work that we can continue to do in solidarity together. So we wrap up with the hope. In conclusion, we are filled with hope at the possibilities of solidarities and anti-colonial struggles within Aotearoa and transnationally. While migrant and indigenous struggles are deliberately constructed as opp oppositional within white frameworks, they're driven by the same or similar global histories and upheld by similar transnational forces of white supremacy in state, institutional, and interpersonal contexts. Listening to each other, building voice infrastructures, growing economies of care, struggling to retain our communicative sovereignties and our narrative sovereignties, our capacity to tell our stories, our own stories, and placing our bodies amidst shared struggles of our registers for transformation that are independent of the deliberately slow and reluctant pace of colonial consciousness. These transformations are simultaneously local and global. They are both economic and political, and most foundationally, they are led through community action and community participation. He says, Kia ora. Um, Keenan Malik notes considerable debate between radical and less radical enlightenment thinkers. Might enlightenment traditions also challenge the very people who often champion them? Yes, <laughs> I would. I would say, um, uh, yeah. I mean, we have to look at the enlightenment period within the context within it formed, which is a transition from the religious justification of slavery and indigenous possession, uh, dispossession towards an intellectual rationalizing of slavery and indigenous dispossession. And in fact, many of the architects were themselves deeply invested in the slave trade and in the trade of stolen indigenous lands. And so um, I think one much of what they are purported to say now um, can be the basis through which you, you challenge and analyze and pick apart uh, and critically and uh, critically reflect upon their positionality at the time as well and uh, you know understanding the way in which critical reflexivity and understanding positionality feeds into a robust intellectual theory these days we have to apply that same rigor to those theories and see if they stand up to to those tests as well so so yes i do believe that you have to at least apply at the very least apply what we believe or that we purport that they are saying against those those same authors and critically uh critically analyze their positionality in that space Kia ora. Uh, we've got a comment um, from Leon Salter, and he says, um, no coincidence that Hipkins announced a boost to military spending after coming back from Char um, Charles' coronation. Um, do you have anything to add about that? <laughs> mm. I mean, militarism and the police state collectively are the, the sharp edge of the colonial project. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, when you come back from a space that has called for people to um, acknowledge and recommit and, um, and pledge their allegiance to the crown, that that would come hand in hand mm -hmm. with the forces that are necessary to, um, to manifest that, to continually manifest that as well. So, no, it's not surprising mm -hmm. at all. I agree it's not surprising that it comes with a commitment to, um, to the crown colonial military forces. Um, and just an acknowledgement um, from Tanya, um, Fritz, um, Ngamahi, Tina and Moha, and great, grateful for the mahi that each of you do and what you'll continue to do together. 
mihea no ki a koe e hoa. Kia ora rā. Ka poi? Yes, 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 of course. Kia ora. Well, tua tahi ake ngā mihi ki a kōrua. Um, there's so many good things in that, what you're saying, so many layered important things that are part of this big nuanced discussion of race and racism. One of the things that really stood out to me, um, well, first of all, there's a whole bunch of things that stood out to me. One was that your um, disarming of the space, that place of democracy, yes. that discourse of democracy that's yeah. often used, well, we know it's been used in the oppression of Indigenous peoples and other peoples around the world. Um, which I think in many ways too, right, is aligned with the construction of nationhood, yes. which is also one of those big colonial tropes that we're always trying to um, disentangle. Mm. Um, and I guess that's what's leading me. I'm getting to a pathway yes. here. But um, it, it seems that in, in Aotearoa at least, and I'm sure around other parts of the world, but this relationship between migrants mm. and Indigenous peoples in Māori and the state um, is that the state has set itself up, the colonial state that is, as the arbiter or the facilitator of that relationship to national imagining. Mm. And that Māori are also sort of, we, in, in many ways, Māori are simply migrants um, mm. themselves ourselves in that mm. state, especially if we look at Joe Mitch and migration. You talked about mm. rural and urban spaces, mm. and we have a migration story within Aotearoa where we suddenly yes, become that's strangers right. That's right. Um, in, in urban spaces. And so, um, it's and so moving to the the strategy, strategies around um, decolonizing perhaps or, or rethinking those relationships it appears that to me at least that that needs to take place between indigenous people and migrants mm. that mm. narrative needs to exist there mm. rather than via the state yes. because they um, uh, provide this romantic story of becoming and um, multicultural, diverse mm -hmm. becoming. We can see it in the curriculum mm -hmm. that we, the history curriculum that we're actually trying to deal with, is that mm -hmm. when that narrative becomes so powerful and centered, mm -hmm. we all get vacuumed up mm -hmm. into that, and it doesn't leave much space for us to have our own narratives of relationality, mm -hmm. as you were talking about, between Indigenous peoples and migrants. So, could you talk about that a little sure. bit more? Um. Kia ora, rai te whanaunga i te tua kana a te tetungane. Um, I tō mihi mai me tō pātai. Now, um, I think one of the things that we see inherent in the dynamic that you're talking about is that when the Crown steps into the space of mediating the relationship, it also erases itself as an actor in that space. In fact, the driver in that space, the one who ultimately controls the movement of both Indigenous and migrant communities in the first place, first of all, through the application of their alliances and complicitness within global superstructures that deny people the right to stay in their own home, let alone to move freely, but the right to stay uh, and be abundant and, and live fruitful lives in their own home. Secondly, the creation of a global economy that denies people the right to stay and live productively on their own lands where they are. And then, of course, the, the upholding of capitalist structures which still maintain, uh, you know, neo-colonial forms of slavery and indentured servitude and labour exploitation that continues to drive people around the globe as well, displace people around the globe as well. They then step into the presumption that they have the right to be able to regulate who can then come here once they're driven from their homes by virtue of those forces, who can come here and where, where they are situated when they come here. Recent discussions about the establishment of, um, of a refugee, of an offshore refugee compound once they are here. And then they also, whilst being, you know, such powerful drivers of this phenomena, uh, assume the right to be able to um, to uh, draft and design and architect how immigrants are treated once they come here as well. And we've recently, again, topically seen um, the resurgence or the reappearance of dawn raids as a form of regulating, you know, migrant um, migrant rights to be here. At the same time, they're also regulating and moving Māori around the place through the creation of colonial land tenure systems and the dispossession of land of people and moving us off our land 
uh, or through um, harm that's done to land that's making it an, an inhabitable, uninhabitable and toxic to live in through the incarceration of Māori communities as well, moving Māori children out of Māori whānau, out of hapū Māori, out of iwi Māori, and they need to have the right to move Indigenous peoples domestically and, you know, of course, the uh, another recent kind of connection in that space of the 501 refugees that are brought back here from overseas and the way in which colonial states in Australia and Aotearoa gain the presumption and the right to be able to mediate that space. When we are having this kind of shared understanding, we actually see that Obviously, the crown is not this neutral figure, you know, neutral figure who has the right to be able to mediate between the two actors. The crown is the dominant actor <laughs> acting upon both of our spaces in that space. And I think that that type of a discussion opens up the space for us to have much more mutually fruitious um, grounds for solidarity and, and seeing change, seeing how and, you know, why it's important for us to support these factors and, in fact, also not turn into tools for that colonially dominant actor to be able to continue that oppression upon our mutual communities. Kia ora. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe, I don't think this is on, is it? Oh, OK. Um, tēnā te mahi ki a koe me tō um, kōrero um, Tautoko. Um, he partai taku. Um, so I just want to um, uh, bring it to today in terms of the why claims. Um, and what I mean by that is that just as recently with the crown, um, uh, the crown there, it just, it annoys me sometimes that they still misconstrue our tikanga, our kupu, tikanga, and mana and turn it around and use it in their how they see it. Now I've been to quite a few um why claims in that and it just annoys me that they continue to do that. And here they are mm -hmm. when you just spoke about the crown as the dominant actor, that's what they're basically doing. And I'm really annoyed at the why claims because I I mean this is my facado. Why are we explaining, continuing mm -hmm. to explain to the crown what what um they you know what our lands were, what they once were, where they all came from and all that. Why aren't they just telling us basically what they stole and what they took from us? Why are we continuing to go through this process? This is their process. It is not ours. We shouldn't be explaining to the Crown what we lost. They should be telling us what they took. That's my whakaro in this anyway. It just continues to annoy me because the more they had a recent white claims, I think, up at two uh two or just recently, and I was on the link. And I just can't get over some of the lawyers in that using these words tikanga mana to suit their own um agenda. When it's not even their word to own. You know what I'm saying? For Māori, these are our kupu, they're very dear to us. They're out, you know, these these words aren't just words that we made up like the English words. These are words that mean a lot, like our tupuna and all that. And I, I, it really annoys me that these lawyers and the Crown can use our kupu to their means and just turn it all around. And you see that through all the systems, all their processes and that and um, policies and that. So, um, yeah, so that's just my whakaro on this. Kia ora. And, um, and if I may, you know, I think that one of the things that that brings to mind for me is the need to continually to continually critically analyse uh, what the Crown believes are solutions to issues. Because and this is, you know, when I was saying that the Crown will make a huge deal out of something and then systemically undercut it, mm -hmm. I think the Waitangi Tribunal is a, is a fantastic representation of that insofar as none of the findings are of course, enforceable, and that's how you can come to the findings of the Paparahi Kitaraki claim that Māori never ceded sovereignty and yet still have a crown which is reticent to constitutional transformation to set that hara right. And so, um, you know, we, we can't underestimate the role of crown self-interest in that space, which is why I think we can't ever expect them to completely own up to what they've done. That said, um, you know, if the crowd admitted 
the, the amount of Crown admitted violations of Te Tiriti from now up until, um, sorry, from 1840 to 1992 is significant and it would take 662 pages to print it all out. Mm -hmm. That's just what the Crown has admitted. That doesn't include, you know, what, what Māori and iwi Māori have held them to account to mm -hmm. through that process as well. So, uh, you know, it would be, it's, it's significantly more than that, of course, we know, but that's just an indication of the level of harm uh, the Crown has through this process, particularly through, um, you know, modern intellectual theory, has ingrained blind spots to its own racism and white supremacy, which precludes it owning up to the fullness of its own hara and sins against Taumari. So it is important, I think, that we speak into that space. If we choose to, we'd probably be best equipped to outline what those sins are. That said, we have to also critically analyze the overarching power structure. Because as Noam Chomsky often says, you know, one way to provide the illusion of liberation or the illusion of justice is to strictly limit the parameters of the discussion and then allow for lively debate within those parameters that they set, that they determine. But we know also that you know, the settlement process is very harmful, it's re-traumatising, it creates false hierarchies, it creates um, almost actually perversely a sidestep to recognising the rangatiratanga of hapu through creating PSGs as well. So there are some deeply problematic aspects within that. There are some really helpful and healing aspects within that process, but we have to also open up the discussion for the deeply harmful and unproductive um, aspects of that process. And ultimately, that it is not our process. We did not define it. It was defined by the Crown um, as well. So, yeah, he mihi anoki a koe, with the hōhonu o tērā pātai. And, yeah, it's a very challenging, controversial issue. Kia ora. Um, oh, we have another online comment from um, Leon, Leon Salter. Um, he says, um, well said, Selena, um, there can be no reconcil reconciliation without admission of wrongdoing. So he's supporting your, yeah, your comment. Yeah, absolutely. Arnold? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two points of that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> No, nah, well, it's just thank you for that. And actually to add on to that, kōrero mm. is that this history of, um, it's kind of like a history of gatekeeping mm. that where you work with the Crown, and I'm sure, you know, we go back to the 80s and beforehand, every time our people work with the Crown, we see our kupu re, uh, return back to us in mm. ways that we didn't give them in the first place. Mm. And I think it's, Graham's just walked in, but I remember reading some of Graham's work on this, I think it was Pākehā Capture, yes. and the capture of our language and the co-option yes. of that language and then That's the right. reusing of that and suddenly finding that the things that we've actually sometimes advised the, the state on come back and it doesn't look like anything. Yes. Um, that we actually talked about in the first place. Yes. And and that's part of that manipulation, particularly when you're that's trying to right. deal with issues of diversity, race, right. uh, and decolonisation. So, yeah, kia ora mō tēnā. Yeah, kia ora. Um, and, the, you know, the, the co-option of tau Māori and particularly our uh, aspects of our liberation, of course, we see that happening in a really contemporary form through white supremacist and conspiracy movements, co-opting our flag, co-opting mm. our symbology, and also triggering our trauma in service of their nationalist agenda as well. And so we see that at the extreme end, but that doesn't happen by itself. That happens upon a backdrop that's created by the crown co-opting our notions, co-opting our culture, utilising terms or claiming the right to be kaitiaki, you know. Yeah. Hey, one person going to be kaitiaki of my yeah. hapu. <laughs> and that's my hapu. And so, you know, the, the presumptuousness um, and the assumptions and the entitlements of, of the crown, which we see embedded in those very early papal laws, this extreme entitlement that survives over time, 
also exhibits itself in the entitlement of the Crown to claim and co-opt these terms, our terms, to decontextualise them and recontextualise them within Crown agendas so that they claim the rights to be kaitiki and they also mm. claim the rights to redefine kaitiki, redefine kaitiki tanga, redefine even, you know, our, our whakatauki as well um, in service of their own agenda. We see that there's, there's a continuity across time of that practice and it's something that we also within Tao Māori, that's an, an internal conversation that we need to mm. really consider and and discuss with with each other around our own permissiveness in that space and our own you know our tendency to lend ourselves into that space yeah. as well because you know who else is going to safeguard our processes our kupu our real our tikanga our whakapauki than us as well so there's a challenge in that i think for ourselves yeah, um, just, um, you know, it just throws me sometimes because, I mean, that here they are assimilating our kupu that they don't own, and yet they want all these big words like manakitanga, kaitiakitanga, but they don't acknowledge our tūpuna, papatua, nuku and rangi and all our others. And so, you know, that's, that's what I mean. I said, why do we give them any, why do we give them that? Why do we give them that power? Why should we share that power with them? When they just keep taking and taking constantly. Kia ora. Pākai pai te rā mo te whare wānanga. You know, tied to that, it also seems that there is an entire industry around consultation, right? So that the Crown can tick markets consultation boxes and give out those consulting monies to PricewaterhouseCoopers and McKinsey, the big five consulting companies. Uh, that, that seems like an entire racket of corruption in and of itself. Right? Yeah, I mean, they've just changed another name, another government agency named to Manawa. I thought, did they even know what mm. it means? Mm. And there are things that we can do to push back and that we have done to push back against that as well. And so, you know, the Crown, as much as in, in the settlement process, as much as that might create um, a potential diversion away from the mana of hapu, PSGs and Runanga can also step into that space to engage, and they do often yeah. step into that space to engage hapu and Runanga to empower that voice within that process. There are opportunities for us to be able to step into that space and reclaim those terms and refuse to allow them to be utilised by those yeah. spaces. So we're not passive actors yeah. in that we do, and I guess that is the call within this dialogue is to call for us to, you know, um, claim what agency we do have within those processes to set right what we can. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just going to agree with what uh, uh, with, with what Mohan has has already said. It's really um, the internal reproduction of consultation process where the state asks, sets the questions, mm. selects the consultants, mm. and then even has the temerity to select the answers they want to read mm. and see. So it's a, a totally biased sort of um, a process, and, and actually we're, we're seeing that right now mm. uh, with, this, with this government and some of the things that are happening particularly in relation to the claim that's on the table. Uh, kia ora korua, uh, ngā mahi nui, uh, kia korua mo te maia, uh, me te kaha, uh, me te nākau nui ki tēnei kaupapa nō reira, tēnei mahi ana kia korua. Um, I have a question about how do we work with uh, our own whānau and communities who are complicit mm -hmm. in the acceptance of uh, the, the power at play and fall into what I kind of see as a, a trap of coercion and co-option. And what is our role? How do we enlighten 
I don't know, after the conversation about enlightenment, I'm not sure if there's the right word to yeah, use. No. <laughs> that's all right. Um, but how do we conscientise mm. those of our own communities who might be complicit and compliant in the process of um, establishing power over us? Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the... Um, one of the gifts of the discussion of, you know, the intentionality of the global uh, colonial project is that it strips away some of those colonial fictions that sit at the heart of complicitness. And, um, and of course, there are many drivers to complicitness. Some of it is self-interest, but some of it also is this deeply embedded understanding that my subservience is, a, is innate within me as an Indigenous person. You know, these cultural fictions that are laid upon us through the Age of Enlightenment, through Enlightenment scholars, but also through colonial narratives that say that if you are Indigenous, if you are a person of colour, that you are destined to play a particular role in society. And, and, um, and so I think, you know, when we are able to further share the story of the doctrine of discovery and its continuity across time and how it's come to shape the things that we've learned, even about ourselves, so that we then wind up becoming actors <coughs> in that space, as Paula Freer talks about, we wind up becoming the purveyors of that colonial logic ourselves, upon, upon ourselves and upon each other as well. And so I think when we can draw out that story um, that can be quite liberating. It liberates you from the idea that you are the problem and it liberates you from the idea that this is your destined role within a, a social structure as well. And it opens up the idea that, um, you know, we can challenge that system um, and that we must challenge that system to create a better future for our children as well. So I think, you know, for instance, the history curriculum reset holds great potential in that space if it is actualized and if the racism that is inherent within the crown education superstructure is also challenged and unpicked in order to make it fit for purpose to be able to carry that kind of cord at all. And I often hear people say that as heavy and challenging as what this story is, it's also liberating because it, it really speaks to your heart and, and reminds you, which you might intellectually know, but you're operating against incredible social forces that are reiterating to you at every given moment of your waking day that you are the problem and that this is right and that in order to be right, you have to operate in this way. Mm -hmm. So I think complicitness operates under those superstructures that are informed by those narratives. And when we can tell the story, sit down and yeah. listen to each other's stories and actually connect to each other's stories and connect ourselves to this broader story, it plays a really strong role in reducing that complicitness. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, and there is so much there, Tina, in terms of the possibilities of dialogue, right? Mm. And I'm really inspired, you know, when I read um, Graham's earliest writings on Kaupapa Papa Maori, mm. and he talks about the intersections of culture, structure, mm. agency. So mm. culture is held, that analysis of culture is held in relationship to structure. And then that, that kind of analysis uh, prevents us from turning just to culturalist logics and, and getting stuck with culturalist uh, narratives as having achieved something, mm. you know? So the, the question really then is how to, in our pedagogy do we come back to that kind of culture structure agency analysis as opposed to the culturalist um, rewards or gifts or um, uh, crumbs that are thrown at uh, different communities, right? And, and also I, I think part of that then relates to, you know, when I was speaking with Tina, uh, one thing that really struck is the courage it takes to speak within one's own community to power and the consolidation of power that, you know, to me, talking about Hindutva, uh, for instance, that's the most, that's the hardest part when your people turn to you and say that um, you're Hinduphobic or um, you are a brown mm -hmm. servant of the uh, white structure because mm -hmm. you're offering that critique, right? So I guess part of that is also how do we keep alive that internal habit 
of critical speaking when uh, the structure is organized in such a way that the pushback often is uh, internal from within the community for challenging those power configurations. Yes, and I think, well, you know, another part of that is speaking to this in terms of systems mm -hmm. as opposed to personalities and individuals as well. Because when you can, un when you're able to identify the system and the logic, it depersonalizes the conversation mm -hmm. in a way that helps you to be able to really unpick, you know, what what is it to be an Indigenous activist, of course, you know, like, and, and you know, these are things that I that we have gone into deep wānanga even here at the Pūtahi Atoia Tō Huki Apati, where we have challenged what is it to be a Māori artist? It's not just to produce art and to be Māori, of course. It's around your kaupapa, your concept, who is it in service to as well. And so when we look at these things that are conceptual and systemic and ideological space rather than a personal space as well, I think it can help us to progress the conversation a bit further. Mm -hmm. Kia ora. Just have a few acknowledgements. Oh, kia ora um, So we have some acknowledgements from here called Kat Holt. Tēnā ngā mihi kia masi for getting Tina to us and for the opportunity to share in mahi that Tina and Mohan have done together. Uh, ka hoki anō uh, ko Tricia Farrelly. Uh, ngā mihi nui anō kia mau kia Tina. Kia ora. I just want to take this opportunity once again to thank you. Tina, you just being here transformed uh, this space and then we will carry with us um, so much of uh, the inspiration that you offered us. And hopefully this is just one part of many uh, such conversations. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for your manaki tanga and the care and the work that you do also, Mohan. And um, he mihi ano ki te puninga kuri ki pūre hūroa um, and rangitāne for allowing us the space to be able to carry this out on their whenua. Kia ora rā, tēnā tātou. Kia ora. Kia ora.